today verse 1 through 9 Joshua chapter 1 verse 1 through 9 and the Bible says after the death of Moses the servant of the Lord it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua the son of Nun Moses assistant saying Moses my servant is dead now therefore arise and go to this Jordan you and all the people to the land which I'm giving to them the children of Israel every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon I have given you, as I have said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates and the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Look at your neighbor, says your territory. <laughs> said no man shall be able to stand before you in all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. Help me out tell your neighbor, be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong. Say it again, be strong. Be strong. This time say, and very courageous. Very courageous. That you might observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, has commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. And this is one of my favorite all-time scriptures. It says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you might observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you should make your way prosperous, and then you should have good success. And then verse 9 says, have I not commanded you? Be strong, say be strong, and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and above all, the doing of his word. You may be seated, those of you who are standing in the house of the Lord. Listen, today I want to talk to you from the title, Strength and Courage into the Promised Land. Help me out, church, and repeat after me. Say, Strength and Courage. Say, I'm going into the promised land. Point number one is there is the promised man. Number one, the promised man. The Bible says, and after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and he said. So here we see that God had a promised man, and his man was the name of Joshua. And it starts off saying that after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, that the Lord spoke to him. I don't want to uh, uh, underestimate the importance for us to communicate with God. Write that in. It is important for us to communicate with God. We need to speak to God, and God needs to speak to us. We bring our petitions before God, and then God brings his commandments to us see it's not about just about what we want God to do for us but it's also about what God wants us to do for him and the Bible said like it did so many times in the life of Moses he said he spoke with Joshua and gave him some commandments see when we we talked about it last week about the legacy of leadership and one of the signs of leadership, especially biblical leadership, is that there needs to be a constant communication with God. That leaders must have the heart of God, must have the mind of God, must know the will of God, must know the face of God, must have the vision that God wants to impart upon them. And the only way you do that is by spending time with him, communicating with him on a regular basis. It's not, it's not a hit and miss thing. It's not an every now and Thing. It's not a, a fair weather friend type of thing. You have a friend that will stick closer to, than a brother. So you need to have a relationship with them. And that relationship is built upon mutual communication. 
We often, we often say that prayer is not dialogue. It's not just one person talking. Prayer is, it, it, prayer is dialogue. Excuse me. Prayer is not monologue. Mono meaning one. Dio meaning two. Prayer is a dialogue. That means there are two parties that are communicating. There's a, there's, and then, church, learn this. There's a time to speak, and then there's a time to shut up. The Bible said you need, to, you need to be swift to hear and slow to speak. Can, anybody, can anyone in the house benefit from that? <laughs> if I could just learn that, Pastor Chuck, if I could just begin to practice that, I, I, I would save myself a world of trouble. If I could just keep that word written on my heart and, and bring it to my remembrance every time I get in my mouth and say something, and then I end up putting my foot in my mouth, and I wish I hadn't said what I said, but I just said what was on my mind. But, but, but if I could just capture that idea uh, uh, and realize that God gave us two ears but only one mouth. That means he wants us to listen twice as long as he wants us to speak. <laughs> so if I can just learn to listen before I'm flapping off at the mouth, I would save myself a whole world of trouble. It's the same way when we communicate with God. It, it, Lord, Lord, it, I, and I, this is my prayer for all of us in here, is that we get to the point that we start our prayer in silence. Start our prayers just listening. Just take two or three minutes, five minutes, however long it takes, just to listen to see if you can hear the voice of God saying something. Before we get down and our old laundry list of, Lord, I want you to do this. I want you to save them. I want you to do this, do that, do that. I'm trying to get a promotion. I got this application in. I'm praying. Before we start to ramble off all the things we want him to do, what if we just start coming to God and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm here. I'm at your beck and call. I'm at your service. Parents, would we appreciate that from our children? If our children came to us and said, hey, hey, mama, daddy, is there anything that you would like for me to do today? Listen, I'm getting ready to play some Minecraft. I'm, I'm getting ready to, to go play some ball down the street. I'm getting ready to go hang out with my boys. I, I, I'm getting ready to go to the movies and see the new Avengers movie. I, but but before, I, before I do any of those things, I, I thought I'd come to you first, Mama. I thought I'd come to you first, Daddy, and just, just to see, uh, is there anything that I can do for you? Come on, parents. I, that wasn't a good enough amen. I thought the church would be shouting by now. But that's how we got to see God. God, what do you want me to do? We want to hear your voice. Listen, we need to have an ear for what the Lord is saying. And we see here in this passage that Joshua had an ear for what Moses, what, what, what the Lord was saying. And then he goes on to say in verse 2, he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people. And I, I had to highlight that in your notes today because I wanted to focus on these people. <laughs> God calls them these people. <laughs> and if you know the history of the situation, sometimes Moses felt like these people. Moses called them these stiff-necked people. He put a little extra on it. He said, these people that you've given me to, to shepherd over, they're not acting right. They're not doing right. They complain every time we turn around, every time we do something for them. Uh, every time you bless them, they say thank you, but then they go about their merry way, and they keep on doing the same. Yeah, uh, so, so the Lord here refers to him, he said, these people, listen, look what God says. He said, Yo, my, mo, my, my, mo, my servant Moses is dead. In other words, his time to lead is over. Now it's your time. Look at your neighbor and say, it's your time. His time for leading is over. His ministry is dead. His ministry is over. Your generation will end. And a new generation will have to take over from where you left off. Listen, I'm about to say something right now. Y'all going to get mad at me. I feel tomato spirits. My pastor used to say I feel tomato spirits. <laughs> but listen, each generation has the responsibility for preparing the next generation for success. Say it one more time. Each generation has the responsibility to prepare the next generation for future success. It means to 
lay the foundation for the next generation to build upon. That's what we see in the life of Moses. Moses had seen, we talked about the Lord that took Moses up, had him go up on the mountain and said, look at the promised land. To have a good look at it, Moses, but you ain't going in it, but look at it. Now take what you've seen and sow the vision of what you've seen into the people that will benefit from the promised land. So he showed Moses the promise that wasn't his, that he would never experience. I wonder how many of us are willing to sow into a promise of someone else for a future generation that we may not see. The Bible said a friend who, who what, what greater love than this than a friend who would lay down his life for his friend would make sacrifices for in their lives to see that their children and grandchildren are blessed. I'm saying something. We, we need to understand that. You ever read one of those stories about uh, 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 the grandmother who had a first grade ed education, if any, who took in ironing and cleaning and did all of those things. She couldn't read, but she made sure her children knew how to read, made sure, made the necessary sacrifices for the children to be able to go to school and have books and, and do book reports during the summertime when everybody else was playing. And she so, even though she was uneducated, she had enough education to know that her children would need an education. And then you read the story and find out that their children grew up to be doctors and lawyers and all the types of things. And they tell the story of how they got there. How did your mama, who had a first grade education, who was very illiterate, how did she do it? She, she was willing to sacrifice for us. See, it got to start somewhere. The sacrifice has to start somewhere. That's what Moses did. Moses made a sacrifice, and he made provision for Joshua to take over. But see, now God is saying, it's time for you to lead these people. Let me, let me uh, uh, just clarify these people. When Moses was denied entrance into the promised land, so was his generation. At the time, Moses said, nobody, God said to Moses, no one here over the age of 20 is going to go into the promised land. So these people that God is referring to is a new generation of people. And they, since they were a new generation of people, God said, my servant Moses is dead. So since it was a new generation of people, then they needed a new situation of management. Anybody remember Mickey Howard, the 80s? I'm in love under new management. These people would need a different type of leader than Moses was. Moses is dead. His ministry has come to an end. These people, this generation of people, you got to reach them in a whole different way. Can I get an amen? This generation that you see before you, that you're called to lead, you got to lead them in a whole different way. Listen, parents, it's not the, the whole do what I say, not what I do thing. That's dead. Don't try that with your kids. You just you just setting yourself up to a lot of a lot of heartache. It, uh, do what I say, not what I do. They see you smoking, but you tell them don't you smoke. They see you drinking, but you tell them don't you drink. That that ain't gonna work. Just here to tell you right now that that not going to work. This generation of young folk need to see you living the life that you want them to live. And if I could be real with you, some of you have very obedient children, but they're only obedient when they're around you. They learn how to play the game around you. And you think, oh, I, got, I got an obedient child. Listen, the goal is not just to raise an obedient child. You want to raise a child that serves the Lord even when you ain't looking. See, you could beat a child. Uh, I, yeah, I said it. You could beat a child into submission. And he'll do what he needs to do just to get you off of them. But, but they, their minds and their hearts ain't changed a bit. And as soon as they're out of your care, they don't do what they want to do. No, we have to sow into the heart of their children. 
to give them a heart after God, to want to seek after God for themselves, amen? You know, a little bit of transparency, transparency won't hurt either, but just a little bit. Can't tell them everything you used to do. You just uh, you just give them enough what they need. You know, they don't need to know all your business, every mistake you make, but they need to know that you made some mistakes so, so that they can know that when they make mistakes, they, you'll help them to navigate their way through it. Are you following? So what God says right here, he says, listen, you have to lead these people. He said the time has come for you to lead these people. Listen, we must wait on God's timing. The thing I love about Joshua is Joshua was Moses' assistant. And I talked about this the last couple of weeks. Uh, that assistant gets access because he's always or she's always in the presence of the person that they're assisting. They have access that most people don't have access to. They have privy to information that, they, that most people don't have uh, 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 are not privy to. And I was thinking about this. I said, man, I, I can identify. Because, see, I've been, into, I've been in some boardrooms I wasn't qualified to be in. I've been on some conference calls that I, that I don't even know why I was on them. <laughs> I just got a message. We want you on the conference call. I, I wasn't expected to say nothing. I need to, I need to present anything and all this stuff. And I, want, I sit around wondering, why am I in this room? We have all these, 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 these heads and all these people of uh, high position and authority. What am I doing here? <laughs> they say, okay, you go sit right there. You go, you go sit right there, and, 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 and it's fine. We'll call on you if you need. And I learned this right here. I learned, I learned how to say this phrase. So if any of you find yourself in, the, in this room, like I was in the room, that you're not really qualified to be in, they ask you a question that you're not prepared to ask you. You say, listen, I don't have the report in front of me. <laughs> But at the conclusion of the meeting, I will look over those, and I'll make sure to send those to you. They come at you again. Well, I don't have those report in front of me. <laughs> can't just say, well, I, I don't know. You can't sit up there and look stupid talk like, yeah, I don't know. You know, you just say, I, well, I don't have access to that information right now, but I will get to you expediently. You use those big $20 words. You, I will get to that expeditiously. I'll get back that to you. So that's why I learned. See, see, when you're an assistant, you, sometimes you're in rooms, and, and you got to see, and, and, Mo, and Joshua received uh, uh, on-the-job training from Moses. And I, got the, and I get the notion that Joshua saw all of Moses' frustration. See, like, Brother Caleb is my little assistant, and, and he sees me all day long. He sees all the ebbs and flows of, of Daddy, of Pastor Chuck. So he sees me when I'm frustrated. I'm happy, he sees what I'm sad. All that. So when you're working as an assistant, you see all the frustrations, you see everything that the leader experiences, and you have firsthand knowledge. And this was Joshua. He's following Moses around, serving as his quote-unquote lowly assistant, but he's learning on the job. And what happens is Moses begins to get a little old up in age. At any point in time, Joshua could have said, you know what, Moses, it's time for you to sit down. It's time for you to time now. Don't you know that David was anointed long before he was appointed? Samuel came to the house of Jesse and anointed David long before David would become king. David, because he wanted to stay in the divine will of God and he understood that you had to wait on, on your timing and God's timing, he understood that even when Saul was trying to kill David and David had an opportunity to kill, kill Saul twice, David passed on the opportunity because he understood that it was not his time. Church, you got to wait on God's timing. Philippians 4, 6 says, to be anxious for nothing but through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving make your requests be known to God. God tells us not to be anxious. Don't worry about anything. Don't be in a hurry to do anything. Find a young person say, don't be in a hurry to grow up. Don't, don't, don't be in a hurry to grow up. One, one of the things that's happening in our culture and our society that, that I think is kind of a good thing is that, that people are, 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 that young people are staying home a little longer and they're, they're waiting to marry a little longer. They're not marrying as quick and they're, and they're staying home a little longer. I think that there's a, as long as that's a planned activity, <laughs> as long as there's a purpose to that, I think, I think that, that that's actually a good thing. You, you don't need to be in a hurry to get out there into the world and do the world things. Listen, listen, young people, once you start paying bills, they don't stop. 
I can't wait to get out and get my own place. Well, once you get your own place, then, then there's a thing called rent and mortgage, and you're going to have to keep paying it, and it's going to come every month. Every se- It ain't going to stop. It's going to come every month. Light bill, every month. Phone bill, every month. Cable, you want cable? Every month. And I'm talking about for the rest of your life, not just for the rest of the year, not just for the, the rest of the decade. I'm talking about for the rest of your life. Once you get out there and start paying that rent, start paying them bills, they're going to come every month. And, 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 and can anybody testify, as soon as you get done paying them all, here they come again. <laughs> anybody ever been there? Man, didn't I just pay this? They sending me another one? So the Bible said, be anxious for nothing. Enjoy your youth. It's okay. Stay young. Be young for a while. And stretch it out if you can a little bit. You get a few more years out of it, go ahead and stretch it out for you. Be anxious for nothing. Your time is coming. Are you following me? He said, but look, and this is why the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and what? Long suffering. That's another word for patience. At the essence of patience is long Suffering, not long blessing, long suffering. That means that waiting sometimes is uncomfortable. Waiting sometimes hurts. But the Bible said, be anxious for nothing, but through prayer and supplication, make your request be known to God and put on the, the spirit. The spirit is going to give you the ability to wait when you don't feel like waiting. And then Hebrews chapter 10, 36, it says, patient and endurance is what you're in need of now. <laughs> said, you need patient endurance, what you need of now, so that you will continue to do God's will. Then, somebody say then, then. you receive all that he has promised. See, Joshua is, be, is a picture of patient, of patient endurance. He waits his turn to leave. And then comes the time when God says, now is your time to leave. He said, leave these people. And then he names these people. He said, the, the Israelites. This generation of Israelites, remember, 20 and under, this, you know, this is the generation that don't know nothing about Egypt. They were born in the wilderness. Oh, I'm about to preach today. They don't know nothing about Egypt. Say this one more, see if y'all get it. They don't know nothing about Egypt. Egypt represents slavery. You get me, Albert? They don't know nothing about slavery. But they want to be experts on slavery. (laughs) They're enjoying privileges that they didn't earn. They don't have sense enough to know it ain't always been this way. They think it's a right to have a cell phone. They don't remember putting your dime in the pay phone and hoping that it clicked the little thing and then just keep your money. Anybody ever put a dime in there and they keep your money and you can't make no calls still? You got to find another dime. And do, do. They don't know nothing about that. They, 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 no, no, I have a right to have no. A cell phone is a privilege. They don't, when you tell them strange fruit, that they comprehend. Oh, that sounds delicious. I'll make a smoothie. No. <laughs> we have young ones in here, so I won't be too graphic, but that was related to lynching. In fact, they don't even know where lynching comes from, the word. A little black history. Can we do a little black history this morning? I know we celebrate Cinco de Mayo and everything, but... The word lynching comes, gets its, gets its name from a man by the name of Willie Lynch. Willie Lynch was a West Indian slave master who had mastered the art of slavery. And not just physical slavery, but mental slavery. He had a technique that was so powerful and it was so effective that we are suffering from it still today. Willie Lynch wrote a letter to the, the, the slave masters in the South, saw how efficient Willie Lynch was and 
send these with slaves. He said, they wrote him a letter, say, we need you to teach us. Do a seminar, do a conference, Mr. Willie Lynch. Willie Lynch sent him a letter. YouTube, Google it. He said, what's what you do? You take the strongest man that you can find, and you just beat him. You let everybody else see it. Take the strongest, take the strongest one, get, find the strongest one, then you just pick him. Then you just beat him. That would set an example for all the rest of them. Said so they do that to you, and then said, so I want you to do take the lighter skins and promote them over the darker skins. Give them preference. Let them work in the house while they, the other ones are. You put them on the field. That they, so that way they start to develop resentment toward one another. They, one will feel more inferior, uh, superior to the other. The other will feel less superior to the other. And all that. And, 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 and you're so in that mentality. Then he said, I'll take this. Black men, black men, can I help you all out? Y'all want to help you understand? He said, 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 take the women and even promote them over the men. You see, this generation didn't know nothing about Egypt. That's why they were always talking, let's go back. We go back for, for some leeks and onions. Why are we out here? They didn't understand. They didn't know anything about from whence they came, so they didn't appreciate where they were. But God said, I need to raise up a leader that understands them and that can lead them into the promised land that is equipped with the knowledge of the past. He was Moses' assistant. So Joshua would know what Moses dealt with. He knew the story. He was right up close with Moses, so he knew he had intimate knowledge on the past. And he was equipped to lead a new generation of Israelites. He, listen, God chooses the right man for the right job. He chooses the right man for the right job. Esther, when you read the book of Esther, you see this statement. Say, you were chosen for such a time as this. Esther became queen just in time for her to save her people. <laughs> read the book of Esther, you'll see a wonderful story of how God uses someone to save a whole generation of people. And in that, we take away, you were chosen for such a time as this. People, you are alive in this season, in this year. You are alive for such a time as this. How many of you wouldn't have made it? <laughs> I just don't know. I just don't know. You, know, you ask that question, how would I have handled slavery in the Middle Passage? Look at the movie Amistad. You want to know about the Middle Passage, the passage from West Africa to the United States? It's a good depiction on what that passage was like. A lot of folks died. Was all over. See, it's, 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 it's horrible. See, see, see I, I don't know how I could have handled that. I'd like to say <laughs> that I, that I would have <laughs> did this and did that, but, but you don't know until you're in a situation what you would do. Amen? So, so he says, I think you have these people. So Joshua, get ready to write, was the chosen leader for a chosen people at a chosen time. That means that your life is predestined by God. You were predestined to be here at this time in this congregation to be a part of this church, to reach this community at this season of life. You're not here by accident. God has divinely and providentially planned for you. You may not even want to be here, but you're still here by God's plan, purpose, and design. <laughs> this may be agonizing for you. How much longer is this going to be? Is 11.45 coming? I'm looking at the clock, and it's getting close to 11.45, and we're only on point number one. <laughs> but Joshua was a chosen leader for a chosen people at a chosen time. I believe that, that God chose me to be the pastor of this church in this neighborhood at this time to reach this people. And I believe that God has predestined me and preordained me and shaped and fashioned me to my preaching style, the way I dress, the way I wear my hair, the way I speak, the way I act. I believe that all those things are a culmination of God putting me together to pastor this church at this time. 
all of my faith journey, my personal faith journey, my personal journey of life just as a whole, that all those things are predestined for me to lead this church even when I don't feel like leading it. And God reminds me, you're chosen like Joshua for this people at this time. And then look what he says in, in, in the C part of part of verse 2. He said, and across the Jordan River into the land that I am giving them. Listen, church, there will always be another river to cross. <laughs> There's always going to be another river to cross. So whatever you're going through right now, I, I know you want to hurry up and get out of it, but, but, but if you're living by faith, then, then just know this, that if once you get out this river, you're going to go have to cross another river. And then after that river, it's going to be another river. The rivers keep coming. But you got to do like Prophet Dory said. Y'all ever see Dory? Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. She was prophesying. What you need to do if you're stuck in a river, you just keep swimming, just keep swimming, Keep swimming because God said you're going to make it to the other side. And then I'm going to have a new river for you to cross. <laughs> he just say, Lord, not my will. I asked you, ask you all before we started, is anybody willing to say yes to the Lord? You, told, you gave me an emphatic yes. So I'm, just, so, the, so I'm here to tell you that the road will not be easy. There's always going to be another river to cross. Once we pay one bill, once we get one need out of the way, once we finish building the ark and get everything that we need in the ark, there's going to be another river to cross. Because God said to just live by faith. And what faith, living by faith, means that you go from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. So, so God doesn't want us to live off of yesterday's miracles. He doesn't want us to live off of yesterday's provision. That's why he says, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, give me today a fresh anointing. I used up the one from Tuesday. I, I, need, a, I need a fresh anointing for the fresh problem, fresh attacks of the enemy that are coming my way. I need a fresh, and that's how we live by faith. That's what it means to live by faith, is that we go from battle to battle, from struggle to struggle, from glory to glory. And in it all, we understand that the battle is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. See, that's where we rest. <laughs> that's, where we, that, that's where we rest. Y'all know me for being transparent. That's how I said, Lord, let's, I just want to throw in the towel. And the Lord had to remind me, this ain't your church. What you tripping off of? <laughs> you know, and, and I talk to God like that. See, see, I'm, I'm hood. I'm just, I talk to the Lord. Lord, what's up with this? And the Lord said, Lord said, when did this become your church? It ain't your church. Why are you worried about it? What, what, what you up for? What you stressing over? Have I not commanded you? What do you go on at the end? He said, have I not commanded you? Did I not, did I not tell you what the promise was? So my job is to stay in my lane. Amen? There will always be another river to cross. Listen, you cannot receive the promise without being willing to cross into new territory. You cannot receive the promise if you're unwilling to walk in new territory. When God calls you into a promised land, he's going to call you to do some things you've never done. You can see some things you've never seen. Did you catch that? Jesus said like this, you can't put new wine in old wine skins. You want some, some new wine, you want some fresh stuff, but, you don't want, but you're trying to stuff it to your old way of thinking. What you need is transformation. See, a lot of times, the promise is already prepared. The promised land has been there. You guys do understand that. The promised land has been there already. The promised land is just sitting over there. In fact, the 12 spies already saw how good and how pleasant it was. So the promised land has been there the whole time. The whole 40 years they're wandering around. Even Moses said, how long have you dwelt in this mountain? It's only an 11-day journey. <laughs> Listen, I, sometimes I like to take the scenic route to get to places, but I'm not trying to add on 39 years and 354 days to it. Did I do that math right? 40 years, 11 years journey, I think I'm right. Check my math, cold kids, check my math on that. But, 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 but I like to take the scenic 
through every now and then to see, you know, see some new things. Sometimes I take another way home, but I'm not trying to tack on 39 years to the journey. Hello? So, so but you, to, to receive the promise, you must be willing to cross over into new territory. Amen? So he says you got to cross this river into sea to the land that I am giving them. This is the Lord saying. If the Lord said it, you're going to get it. Next, Joshua 1 and 3 says, I promised you what I promised Moses. <laughs> he said, wherever you set your foot, you will, you will be on the land that I have given you. Listen, what a blessing for God. What a blessing from God. What a thing to have God say to you. Wherever you set your foot, <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> Man, if the Lord told me that, I'd be stepping on all kind of stuff. I'll be jumping on top of Mercedes Benzes. Woo! The Lord said it's mine. Ferrari. I go down. I'm going down to the Ferrari dealership. Ferrari. Just say, why are you stepping on the cars? Because the Lord said, wherever I set my foot, it's mine. Amen. I, I I go in somebody else's church. I'm stepping my foot. The Lord said, this is our church. You got to get out. The Lord said. The Lord said. The Lord said. He said that you'll dwell in mansions that you have not built. So I'm just acting. Let me talk about this, and we'll be out of here. I got five minutes to get through this point. Obviously, we're not going to get to point number two and three. We'll say that to next week. Next thing I want you to write is generational blessings versus generational strongholds. Come on, church, write that down for me. Generational blessings versus generational strongholds. Let me be very clear because I want to be clear on this teaching. We don't teach and we don't give any power or credence to generational curses. We don't acknowledge generational curses. The reason that we don't acknowledge generational curses is because the Bible said that he made who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God. In that same passage in Galatians, he said that he became a curse for us, that he might redeem us from the curse. So, if you are a child of God, you are not obligated to any generational curses. Whom the Lord has set free is free indeed, according to the word of God. So we don't give any life to generational curses. But we do acknowledge generational strongholds. There are things in your family that can be passed down from generation to generation whether intentionally or non-intentionally, whether consciously or subconsciously. Are you following me? So, but so there is a difference of generational cursing as opposed to generational strongholds. Catch that? If daddy drinks a lot and the kids grow up watching daddy drink a lot, Every time daddy gets frustrated, he goes out and drink. Then what is Johnny going to learn to do when he grows up and gets frustrated and learns to drink? He's going to learn that this is how you do it. You try to drown your sorrows in consumption. If Johnny witnesses a lot of domestic abuse in the house, then he grows up. He said, well, that's how I need to relate to my woman is to make her to overcome her by physical strength and domination, and that's how I have an effective relationship. Church, can I, can I take it a little bit further? Young ladies grow up and see their mothers being abused in abusive relationship, and even though they swear that when they grow up, they're not going to date men and be around men like that, even though they made it in their hearts and their minds that that's not what they're going to do, that's exactly where they find themselves at, the same thing. And they learn the lie that that. He hits you because he loves you. I know I'm saying something. Those are generational strongholds that we pass down, we pass down. The only way to break generational strongholds is to do so intentionally. Debt is a generational stronghold. Is it not? We pass down debt. We pass it down, we pass it down, we pass it down. The only way that we break it is that we make a stern decision and have a plan to overcome it in our lives so that we can plant those seeds in our children to teach them how to deal with their finances better than we were taught. A lot of us weren't taught finances. We just got to learn on the, on the fly because our parents learned how to fly. No, our parents didn't sit down and say, well, this is how you manage money, 
right? Anybody blessed to have that? If you had that, you, you're blessed to have that. But for most of us, it's just, hey, see you later. Go on, go on out there doing good, right? Go to college. You got some, some kids in college and kids going to college that, could, that can uh, 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 testify to this. You go to college, you ain't got a job at all. First week of school, first week of school, you fresh on campus, you don't have a job, you have no money, you just there. You got what your mama sent with you, little some bologna sandwiches and two, uh, you know, a big case of top ramen. <laughs> Might have your little fridge or something like that, and maybe a little t you know, that's all you have. And you go to college. And they're gonna have a row of people that are trying to market to you. They have a row of credit card companies say, hey, Mr. College student, so glad to have you on campus here. We have a Visa card for you, $1,000 limit. See, you don't have much. You need to buy some incidentals. You need to buy some books and all that stuff. Say, we're going to give you. You ain't got a job. But they're going to give you a credit card. You don't have a job, but they're going to give you a credit card. You have no source of income, but they're going to give you a credit card. And you take that little $1,000. This is what happened to me. You take a little thousand. Woo, all right. Man, I got me a car. And I listen to all the rap songs. And rap songs say, if you got a, yeah, I got a black car, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you excited that you got a car. Yeah, I got a platinum card. And you excited. Yeah, I got platinum. I got, woo, 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 woo. This ain't platinum. This is aluminum, but it's all right. I got the aluminum. And then you go down to the mall. Stop at Macy's. So go to Macy's. Macy's said, woo, all right. Go to Macy's. Pick you out some stuff. Say, man, I need me some fresh gear. I'm a freshman, I need to look fresh on this campus. I need to, I need to represent, they, they need to know that I'm here. You know what I'm saying? So I need to take this little thousand dollars, need to give me some fresh gear. And then you go, you grab your little stuff, you got your little thousand dollar limit, you grab your little stuff, and you're ready to check out. And then the little, la the little girl at the counter say, would you like to save 20% today? <laughs> I say, whoa, I'm, I'm all about saving 20%. Well, all you have to do is you open up a Macy's account. What, how I do that? Well, all you need is a major credit card. Ooh, well, I got this aluminum card that I just got. <laughs> That's all I need? That's all you need. You get 20% off. So if you don't use your $1,000 aluminum card, now you use your new Macy's account. And then you say, well, if they do this at Macy's, <laughs> they might have this at Nordstrom's. <laughs> you run over to Nordstrom. Nordstrom say they don't give you 20, they give you 15. Oh, we can roll with 15%. Now you got aluminum visa card and you got Macy's and you got visa and you start charging them and then <laughs> see they get you because they say hey you buy this and you know got little incentives you get 60 days you don't have to pay it back for 60 days so you cool for 60 days <laughs> till day 60 come around now you got a bill <laughs> from aluminum visa <laughs> Macy's <laughs> and Nordstrom's <laughs> And you still ain't got no job. <laughs> you see the kind of, see what I'm talking about? See what I'm talking about? And we get into that, and we get into that cycle, and we get into that cycle, and get into that cycle, and get into that cycle. And you pass those down, and if you're not if you're not if you're not intentionally breaking them, strongholds just pass down. They're not curses; they're just strongholds. They're just ways that you're living your life before your children, and you're teaching them your habits, whether you're doing it intentionally or unintentionally. But, but look what we're talking about here. He said, they're going to get the land that I've sworn to them. What God is saying, they're going to get the land of generational blessings. They're being blessed not because something they've done, not because of something they've earned. They're getting blessed simply because God made the promise to bless them. That's it. Oh, Somebody say grace. 